From Las Vegas, Nevada, the entertainment capital of the world, I'm David Gabbard, and this is the Vegas Faces Podcast, where we talk with Las Vegas locals about what it's really like to live in the city of lights. Whether you're living in Vegas, moving to Vegas, or just visiting Vegas and looking for new adventures, together let's discover the hidden gems that make Sin City the most visited place on earth. Hey everybody, welcome to Vegas Faces Fast Facts. These are our short clips about specific topics from right here in Vegas. I'm David Gavry, I'm a realtor with Realty One Group Summerlin, and today's topic is poker. Summertime is around the corner, which means the World Series of Poker is almost here. With us today is Mark Newhouse, a legendary poker pro. He made history when he made the World Series of Poker final table two years back to back. No one has done it since, and it's very likely that it'll never happen again. This is gonna be really fun. Mark, thanks for being here on Vegas Faces. Let's just get right into it. 2006 seemed to be like a real big year for you. You made close to 2 million in poker earnings that year. What was that like being in your young 20s, hitting these big scores and these real deal World Series of Poker tournaments, WPT tournaments? Like, what was that like? Well, I turned 21 in 2006 and I had been playing online poker for a couple of years before that. And uh, I went to my first World Series of Poker in 2006 before I won the big tournament and was playing big and winning and and uh, everything was going great wasn't even planning on playing this uh this wpt i i had never really played a tournament before at the time it's different now but back then it used to be the cash games would follow the tournaments uh so wherever the big tournament was you would go to that city to play the good cash games uh these days it, they kind of have separated and uh and especially for the game that that I played and and that I play now is Limit Hold'em uh, almost doesn't even exist anymore outside of Vegas and California. But uh, so yeah, I went to <clears throat> went to Atlantic City and uh, I had been playing uh, I've been playing a two and four hundred limit game all night and the game broke and three the three guys who were left decided we're going to go play a satellite for this WPT uh, and I ended up getting in through the satellite, no sleep, going and playing day one, not barely taking it seriously at all and having fun. And then like at the end of day three, I had a lot of chips and we're playing in a 500,000 limit game that I'm much more focused on than caring about the tournament. People are telling me I should go to bed. The game ended up breaking and i got some sleep and you know a couple days later i ended up winning the tournament so that was fun 21 years old had had never really uh first wpt second no limit hold'em tournament ever and wasn't taking it seriously at all then all of a sudden i i'm i'm super confident and all i want to do is play the biggest games against whoever and i i burned through that i burned through that 1.5 million pretty quickly (laughs) What does that even feel like to to make the 1.5 million and then to lose the 1.5 million? I I lose a thousand dollars and I'm like shattered. Yeah. uh, Oh no. I mean, I was, I was out of my mind for a while. I I moved into the commerce casino in LA and I, uh, yeah, I was, I was definitely at that time, 21 years old. I was, uh, it, a lot of it's a blur, <laughs> but I was definitely looking to light the money on fire any way I could. Winning it felt great. I felt like I'm I'm the best poker player in the world, and uh, this is just going to happen every month. Uh, you know, I'm going to go win another million in the, in the next one, and and uh, <laughs> that's that's just how it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, and that happens too, right? Like especially when you win young, like right out the gate, you just think like, oh, this is easy. Like I could just I could just print money now. <laughs> without even feeling like, oh yeah, you know, there's also a downswing coming too, or, or there's going to be a period of time where this isn't as easy as it looks. And, and leading up to that, uh, cash games were going really well for me. I was playing big, uh, before I won the tournament, right before I turned 21, I had $200,000 months in a row on party poker that made me drop out of school and go to commerce and, and started the whole trajectory. What brought you to Vegas? Well, my first time in Vegas was my first World Series of Poker, uh, 2006. And that was a time when I, uh, 
that was a time when Limit Hold'em was a very, very popular game. And we were playing big that summer when I was 21. I played as big as eight and 1600. Real fast, Mark, that, what is the what is a buy-in for eight 1600 limit? Well, a buy-in for 8160 is is usually about 4,000. So we, I, I'd say uh, probably, we'll say 50,000. Five zero? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it, eight and 16 is actually played with uh, multiple colors of chips, which uh, is, is a bit unique for six and 12 and eight and 16, you play with 500s and 100s. Um, but a rack of fives is, let's say you get a rack of fives, that's, uh, that's 50,000 and, you know, maybe colored a little, a stack to black chips of, uh, of hundreds. So that's probably a buy. So like, can I ask a logistical question? Like buy-ins 50,000, does that mean you walk into the casino with 50,000 cash or do you just wire the money to the casino cage to, to get chips? Like how do you cash in and cash out with that much like liquid? Uh, at, at that time, I believe I did wire money to the casino my first time in Vegas. If I'm traveling between LA and Vegas, I would probably bring chips or, or some cash. Uh, I, my days of doing things electronically, I don't really do that anymore. But I think that at that time I did wire some money because I had just cashed it out of party poker and I just wired it to the casino. I think I wired it to Bellagio or, or maybe to Rio. But yeah, I, I also, I, I, at that time I didn't know anyone. Now I know people, you know, it's, it's, it's not that difficult to to get money if people know that I'm good for it. So, okay, you're on this trajectory, and then I'm interested in the lead up to the first World Series final table. The main event, 2013. Uh, you know, obviously a, a different era. Um, I had been through a lot and I had, 2006, I had, I had just about $2 million and I managed to burn through it all by 2007. And then I had some years of, of uh, struggling and learning lessons and making some runs and building up some money and you know not necessarily holding on to it but uh, a lot of swings happened over the next seven years and a lot of financial and emotional highs and lows in in the in the big limit cash games uh but at the time in 2013 i had kind of settled on playing in some mid stakes games and uh, doing some things a lot better than I was doing for, for a while, like 2007 to 2010, I was, I was kind of a mess and, and really uh, getting myself into debt and making all kinds of mistakes. Uh, you know, by 2013, I had kind of uh, gotten things a little bit more stable, but I wasn't, wasn't doing great. I was at a point where, you know, I was able to survive and, and, and whatnot playing in mid stakes games. So leading up to it, I played, uh, yeah, it just played the main event and tried to kind of, my focus was just on getting through the day and just playing five levels of poker every day and not really going out of my way, trying to think about accumulating chips, uh, main event is two hour levels and, uh, and then, you know, eventually you're, you're getting down there and there's three tables left and it's day seven and they're tearing everything down. How many hours do you play? 10 hours, 12 hours? Uh, the main event is 10 hours of poker plus uh, dinner break and plus breaks in between each two hour level. It's five, yeah. five, two hour level. Wow. Uh, so I think it comes out to about 12, maybe 12 and a half hours. Wow. Yeah. So like, okay, day one, day two, day three, all the way, finally day seven is is the final table what is that like from like a human standpoint forget like the the chips and the money and all that it's like wow all these like lights all you know espn cameras like it's a big spectacle like what was that what was that like to just um, be there does it affect how you play did it affect your game and in, in that regard like your mental state and all that kind of thing i think the cameras i could handle um but it's definitely a realization that like Wow. Well, so I've, before I made it, I've, I have several friends that made the final table before me. Um, Chino, uh, Grinder, Kelly Kim. I had been there watching my friends make it before at least, but it is, 
yeah, you kind of realize that, wow, like this is, this is real and this is really possible. And, uh, I got a shot to really make some life changing money here. So before the, the big tournament in 2006, I was not a tournament guy at all. I'd never really played a tournament, but after I won the Borgata, I, I started traveling and playing everything. So I became a tournament player. Uh, and there, I had a, a stretch of years that I played a lot of tournaments. Um, I don't really remember what I was doing in 2013, but I feel like I was playing less and I was more of a limit hold'em guy at that point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it basically just happened, you know, I, I, I'm playing and then all of a sudden I'm there. And then was it like to do it again? Like I, I know from like a professional standpoint, you obviously want to win and you want to get first place, but like, has it, you know, now that time has passed to do the repeat back to back final tables, knowing that it's very unlikely that that ever happens again in the modern era when there's over 10,000 people entering the main events, like, it, like how does that kind of settle with you? Like knowing that like you, you have a piece of poker history regardless of the financial uh, outcome. Well, yeah, no, I, uh, I, every time somebody gets close, I'm rooting for them. Um, because then maybe I get to stop hearing about me and how great I am for, for like <laughs> whatever happened in my life. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's a very disappointing, um, thing for me. Uh, and I mean, enough time has passed and I'm, I'm very used to hearing about it all the time. Um, and I, you know, I can't go anywhere, any city I go, it's it, all they want to tell me is, wow, that's, that's a great accomplishment. Wow. You're, you're, you're really good or, or whatever. And I'm, I'm used to that, but so, um, 2014, both years I was sponsored by, uh, the commerce casino. Um, I, I wore a commerce patch, uh, and in 2014, um, I guess maybe partially because we didn't really negotiate the deal until the very end, but also, so, so the whole four month break when I'm like happy, when, when I've done something great and, you know, on top of the world, uh, yeah, there, there wasn't really anything after I busted ninth and bluffed all the chips off and all of that, uh, I got back to LA. And this was actually, I've had two stretches of my life for over a year living in the Commerce Casino. The first one was right after I won the Borgata and the second one was in between 2013 and 14. Um, but uh, so I was living upstairs and I go downstairs, there's a big banner on the wall, congratulations, Mark Newhouse. And this is after I just busted ninth and, and uh, so I didn't even want to show my face in there. Uh, and yeah, I, I've, I've been everywhere I go, I hear how great I am. Uh, I, I, uh, definitely bluffed my chips off in a spot that I, everywhere I go, people also tell me that I played good and those people are wrong. Uh, I definitely played bad. Uh, we can talk more about that later, but, uh, yeah, so it's a pretty disappointing thing. I had the first year I was short in chips and didn't really have as high of expectations. And uh, I didn't really do anything wrong. I, I think I, it was like pocket nines versus ace king. I don't even remember which side I was on. It was it was a flip and there was it was unavoidable. Um, the second year I had chips after days five, six. There were two days that I ended the tournament as chip leader. Uh, so I'm feeling super confident. Um, I was third in chips at the final table. You know, I am the story. Uh, so I have all the media attention. I have, uh, this is, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to win $10 million. This is my year redemption and whatever the way that they put it in the magazines. Uh, and then in a completely unnecessary spot i bluffed all the chips off in a an unnecessary spot b against a guy who's never folding a better hand than me uh and c in a spot where even moving up one place in money and that extra like two hundred thousand 
pay jump would have done a lot for me uh, after having four months to burn through all the money. Uh, so yeah, it was a pretty disappointing thing for me um, that uh, that second time around. And I had a lot of the, the four month break. I had a lot of momentum. I was feeling good. I was playing good. I was really holding over people. And uh, the four month break, everybody else got coaching. I just kind of traveled and didn't play any poker and wasn't really on a good rhythm of things. So uh, I, I could have handled that better as well. And uh, that the four month break did not do me any favors. That's for sure. For me, like as a fan, just as a spectator, I look yeah. at it as like, don't be so hard on yourself. I look at it as that was a spot where you're, you're playing to win. Like, and again, as a spectator, like I find poker has as much as I love poker and I still love playing poker casually. I appreciate the game the strategy, everything. I find it not as exciting to watch because now you, everyone we're in a phase where everything's very like mathematical. Everyone's very robotic. There's no more character. There's no more personality. It's, it's all about the play, which is cool. But, um, I think a big reason why like ESPN no longer covers it and it's not like mainstream like it used to be is that just watching it has become a little bit dry. Uh, how do you see poker down the road? Is this something that you um, are kind of burnt out on? Is this something that you'll always like this is always okay. going to be your life? Like where are you at now with poker? Well, how do I let's first let me answer. How do I see poker down the road? Uh, I don't see a good future. I think I think so for the limit games i'll start with that and then we'll get into no limit um and and anything else so in 2006 i was 21 i was brand new on the scene i was the the youngest guy in the limit game and 18 years later now uh there's maybe like two or three guys in the whole scene that are younger than me i was i really got in right at the end and limit is a dying game uh, the games are a lot smaller, a lot less consistent than they used to be. People who used to play 400, 800 in LA are now playing 6120. It's uh, so that's so that's dying. Um, but that said, the games that do run are still good, and I'll get into that. The reason for that. Um, let's talk about No Limit in Vegas, LA. I don't have a lot of experience anywhere else. It's as, as you said before, like people may don't watch it on TV because it's very mechanical. Everyone has done their homework. No one plays bad anymore. Even, even the ones who like, aren't really good. They aren't bad. What are your thoughts on those guys that run table one at Aria that, that yeah. their slogan is like, make poker fun again. And, uh, they show a lot of videos of just like crazy hands and like, not so uh, mechanical game theory optimal play. I haven't seen the videos. I do have two very good friends who play in that game. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is what's tricky. Is I do I believe that the privatization of the big games killed the mid stakes. But at the same time, if if they didn't do it, the games are no good, and you know the 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 fish aren't having fun. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, no, these, these big private games are great. Uh, and like, so let's say if I win a tournament this summer, I might try to start playing in games like that or live streams or, or whatever. Um, so if you have a bankroll to play really, really big right now and a personality to get invited, uh, yeah, it's poker is great. But there's, it's, it's very difficult to get from small to mid stakes to actually get up to that game. Cause that's a big game. What's the buy-in for a game like that? It's probably, uh, I think they play hundred, hundred or hundred, 200, which, uh, you probably might buy in 20 to 50, but you know, you would want to have a lot more than that. You would probably need at least, uh, quarter million, half million to really feel comfortable playing the game. Do you get to a point where you just get numb to, uh, to the amounts like, Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to buy in for 500 K. Like, like, is there a number that 
makes you nervous when you put it on the table? Well, right now is very different than let's say 15 years ago. I, I used to play a lot bigger. I don't, I don't have the $2 million I had when I was 21. So, uh, you know, at that time, not, I wanted to play as big as possible and not a whole lot scared me. Uh, now, you know, I got, I got bills to pay. I'm, uh, I'm a little bit grown up and things are, things are different, but you know, let's say I, if, if I win, uh, $10 million in the main event, maybe I'd find a balance where, uh, I can play fearless poker and also be a little responsible. Like when or, you're, or maybe I'd figure something else to do with my life. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. When you're a poker pro and you're playing every day, like, does it even like, okay, you, you win today, lose tomorrow, win the next day. Like, how do you, like, I, I guess uh, when you're playing so much, like, do the wins even mean anything? Do the losses even mean anything? Cause it's like, you're just going to play again tomorrow or even later today. Like, how do you quantify? Winning feels good. Losing does not. So I actually, I manage myself very differently from a lot of people. Um, and lately less so because lately I actually try to keep it, it. I'm on a very late schedule right now. I'm waking up about 4 PM and, and playing until like 7 AM. But I keep it, it while I'm on late hours, I keep consistent hours. Um, and my, I, I keep my sleep pretty consistent, but there, there was a lot of years that I did not do that. Um, and even now I, I like to manage myself differently than most people. Most people, when they are losing, they never quit. And when they're winning, they, they just book a small win and go home. I do the opposite of that. Um, which I've actually conditioned myself to where I really don't like losing. I don't, I don't like the feeling of losing. I, I, when I'm at the table and I'm losing, I'm miserable and I want to get out of there. And, uh, and, and somehow I've conditioned myself to where, uh, it's very easy for me to do that. So if I, I, I come in, I start out losing and things aren't going my way. I leave when I'm winning. I really, I like to push it. This is definitely a piece of advice that, uh, that people can take when you're, when you're winning, you, regardless of what you might tell yourself about how you're playing at any time, when you're winning, you're playing better. You're feeling better when you're losing. A lot of people might say that they don't go on tilt, that they don't, they're not affected, whatever. So even if that's the case, you're, when you're losing, you're, you're not in as good of a mood. And not only that, but the other people you're playing with are winning and they're holding over you and they're making better decisions right now than they would be if they were losing. Uh, and when you're winning and they're losing, it's a very good situation to be in and it's very valuable. And those are the times to really press it and play longer. Um, and most people do the opposite. And when they're losing, they keep playing. And that's what's kind of beautiful about the way that I manage is I have someone to play with because they're losing and they don't want to give up. But, but I like to push it and I like to, you know, go home proud of myself because I won a number that is, that most people don't think of winning in that game. Um, but then when I'm losing, yeah, I, 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 I never lose big. I, I, I just, I don't like being there. If I'm, if I get stuck a couple racks, I just go, I just leave. Some players win almost every day but then they go off and lose huge one day and, and lose it all back where I'm more likely to actually book more losses. But, uh, when I win, I press it. I mean, what's that saying? They say how losing feels worse than winning feels good. Yeah. Uh, you know, like that that's, uh, well, that's, that's true. If, if you, uh, if you, unless you cut your losses early. Wow. I mean, that's really, Everything that you've been through with the with making money, losing money, and to where you are now, it's very wise. It's it's definitely, uh, you know, everyone progresses like from their early twenties to their thirties and forties. It's like, oh, okay, let's learn from those mistakes that we made at the at the younger years. Let's not do that. So to now where you're, if you're managing losses like that, 
I don't know. That seems to be a huge piece. Like that's huge. Yeah, that's and that's something that over the years, like I said, I've really conditioned myself to where it just comes naturally. It's not like I'm consciously thinking about it, but the reason is because when I'm losing, I just don't want to be there. And, yeah. and when I'm winning, I feel I'm, I want to go for a record or something. So, yeah, yeah, like when you're so, losing in poker, you feel like everybody knows something about you. Like they all they're all looking at you like, oh, like, I mean, they are looking at you because they're like, yeah, oh, yeah. he's, he's the weakling he's today. Sucking. You're yeah. the sucker today. And you, you, you're like, wait, but yesterday I was the winner. And even now today even I'm if, you're, if you're the toughest player, like, you know, oh, today's the day we're going to get him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to kind of like a quick question about like the business side of poker. Like you wow. mentioned how like people stake you and like. Uh, you know, like how the commerce sponsored you and stuff like that. Like, what is what is that part like with the with the players? They, uh, you know, they what, what's the word? back backing and investing uh, well, and, and all that kind of stuff. So the commerce, uh, I just got paid to wear a patch. That's that's all that was. Um, so that's a little different from like staking kind of deals. That was that was just a one off uh, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, over the years. As a uh, poker player who has had the swings that I've had, I've had times when I'm doing very well and times when I'm doing very poorly. Uh, and when times are tough, the way you stay alive is uh, you, yeah, either either borrow money from friends or, or get staked. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, in poker, you know, there's, Nobody signs anything. It's all, uh, you know, everybody is, it's a pretty trusting world, uh, whether, whether or not it deserves to be. Um, but I think most people in poker are, have a level of, uh, integrity and, 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 uh, and like to try to do the right thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a world where, uh, it's a, it's a swingy lifestyle, um, especially like the old days of playing big limit. Um, and you know, people help each other out when, when necessary. That's, uh, I, I did have a stretch like way back in the day where I was getting staked by sheets and backs. And that was really more of like a business relationship, but most of the times, uh, it's more of a friendly kind of thing you know most of the times when you're when you're getting staked it's your friend doing you a favor and they're not in it to make money when you unplug from poker what do you like to do here in vegas like i saw on your instagram you went to the sphere to see the fish concert which was yeah. nuts i i went to the u2 concert which was mind blowing like i i only knew like three songs of theirs i could care less mm -hmm. about the band more so than just like the optics and the visuals on the sphere like what was it like being at the fish concert at the sphere. Uh, yeah, I, I also saw you too. Um, and wow. I'm also kind of the same, not, you know, they're not really into their music and, uh, I fish, fish was awesome. Um, I, uh, they, they put on a really good show. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, so I've been to something in the area of like 10 fish shows. Uh, I'm actually a big fan of the grateful dead. Uh, more so than Fish, but Fish is very talented and puts on an awesome show. Uh, I'm excited for Dead and Company next month. They'll be at the Sphere. Uh, yeah. I'm sure those shows will also be great. Uh, Fish does is like more creative with like intricate things they do with set lists, and their fans are like super nerdy about it. The things that I don't understand, but uh, but yeah, it, it was. It was it was a great show. I'll certainly be seeing Dead and Company when they are around. And I haven't, I have not decided yet uh, during the World Series of Poker what sleep schedule I plan to be on. I'm either going to be on night shift and play Limit Hold'em or day shift and play a bunch of tournaments. But I'll figure that out when it comes. But yeah, that's the my unwind is basically the first half of my day. I I like to uh, I like to try to just kind of have some space. So I spent, like I said, I spent two years of my life living in the commerce casino, two stretches of over a year. And, uh, I don't, I don't live like that anymore. I, I like to keep my distance. I, I don't want to live on the strip. 
I like to, I like to keep my distance and I like to, I like to have a full morning routine. Uh, I also don't play online for that reason. I, a separation of home and office and, uh, and that's, uh, that's very important to me. Mark, it really sounds like you've wisened up like real talk, like everything that you've been through and to where you are now to where you're on a consistent schedule, like you're doing healthy things, you're doing things that are good for you. Like all of it sounds awesome. Like it sounds very positive and it sounds like you're headed in a positive direction. It's exciting to, to see what you can do next. You did a, a very historical thing and now it's like you, you're, you've got a, a good head on your shoulders, like you're really focused and regardless of, of outcome, just like, like they say, right? Like focus on process. I see you doing good things and, and positive things later on down the road. And it's, it's really cool um, seeing your, your whole evolution from, from uh, hitting a big score as, as a young, you know, 21 year old, not knowing how to handle it to where you are now, like wisened up. Again, I'm a fan. I'm totally rooting for you from the sidelines, but I, I see you doing good things. I, I hope that, you know, this summer, uh, whatever you end up playing in the World Series, I, I really hope that it goes well for you. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Mark, it's been a pleasure, really. Thank you for being one of the Vegas faces. Yeah, for sure, man. I'll see you around. Thank you for subscribing to Vegas Faces on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok under the name Gavry Group. That's G-A-V-R-I Group. Thanks, everybody. See you at the next episode.